Hey y'all, Data Guy here, and today I'm back with yet another viewer request video. Um, this time, comparing Apache Flink to some of its competitors that some people thought were more appropriate, um, which is Apache Spark and Apache Storm. So the kind of common thread here is that all of these tools are very prominent frameworks for processing streaming and batch data. Um, and what I'm going to aim to outline here in this video is the limitations of each, the strength of each, the ideal use cases for each based on their architecture and capabilities. So for each tool, I'm gonna to give you an in-depth overview of how each framework is set up, how they work, kind of how they're typically set up in production, the pros and cons of that tool, and then also the best use cases for that particular tool as well. Um, and then hopefully you'll leave here with a good idea of which tool, Apache Flink, Spark, or Storm, is right for your particular use case. And we're gonna start off with the star of quite a few comparison videos now, uh, Apache Flink. It seems like everyone wants to come at the king. Um, and so Apache Flink, just kind of diving into it, is a really powerful distributed stream processing engine um, that's designed for both real-time and batch data processing. And so unlike um, some other tools, like, you know, really any other tools that focuses just or like bolt on streaming as part of an extension of batch processing, Flink is really built to be stream native. Um, it treats batch processing as like a subset of stream processing, which kind of is, you know, batch processing is really slow stream processing, essentially. Um, it's kind of inverse of batch process or stream processing is really fast batch processing. Um, but it's really designed saying, hey, every single event uh, is going to be processed just as it was created. Uh, that's the core of its capabilities and you, know, you can slow that down, but by default, that's what it's going to do. Um, and so it supports both event time and processing time semantics and that allows it to handle out of order data efficiently. So it knows how to put data out back in order, even if there's like some lag and some data that was generated before another data point is actually comes in after. It knows how to handle that and still reconcile and make sure, hey, they're all stored in the proper time frame um, and on the same time series. Um, and its architecture is centered around stateful computations, uh, making sure that everything is very you know, correctly typed and ordered and tracked and offers exactly once processing guarantees through distributed snapshots. Um, and some benefits of this is that it is a true streaming architecture. Uh, Flink is processing data in real time with low latency. Um, it supports complex event processing really efficiently, does stateful processing really well. It's got tons of state management capabilities. You can develop really sophisticated applications that need to maintain that state over long periods like real-time analytics or fraud detection. And then it also has event time support. So it has the ability to process data based on event time that also makes sure you can allow for, you have accurate computations even when events arrive out of order like I described. Um, and then for fault tolerance with distributed checkpoints, Flink ensures that there is fault tolerance and exactly once processing guarantees, which really drives down the risk of data loss or duplication of data. Um, on the con side of things, there's a pretty complex API. You're gonna have a pretty high learning curve for Flink's API. It's not the easiest tool to use by any means. Um, especially for stateful streaming, it's gonna be kind of a pretty steep learning curve um, if you're used to, especially if you're used to like, you know, just batch processing. Um, and then also it's got a pretty small ecosystem in terms of library support for things like, uh, you know, machine learning, graph processing, just really not as extensive um, as, you know, tools like Apache Spark, which is really kind of used ML data processing as almost a second life for that tool. Um, so now a little bit on how it's built in production. So just kind of up here, you have basic structure of how Flink works. You know, essentially you have an event that's ingested by the Flink application. That state is stored and written to async, uh, an asynchronous persistent storage. That's kind of acts as a checkpoint. Then you have an action that's triggered. So transforming that data, saving it somewhere else. And then you also have writing the history of what event occurred to an event log. So then that's saved in a, another application. So you can see a lot of uh, kind of recording of exactly where data is going and what happened within that action. Um, and then actually setting this up in, in production, this application will be really a distributed cluster of nodes with a job manager and task managers. So the job manager is gonna coordinate job execution and allow you to ingest hundreds, thousands of events all at the same time and manage different applications and VMs, um, which are the actual task managers, 
um, to run those tasks and perform those transformations and you know the actions that are triggered here. Um, and so some common setups that you'll use to actually power this are Kubernetes for containerized deployments, um, or there's other platforms like you know Apache Yarn or Apache Mesos for resource management. Um, and Flink's fault tolerance really relies on this integration with those with those persistent storage systems for checkpointing and state persistence. Um, and then commonly you'll layer in things like Grafana and Prometheus um, to monitor uh, your you know, environment's health and performance. But you have to really set up that monitoring around the Flink stack. And so summary for Flink, best use cases for Apache Flink are number one, real-time analytics. Um, Flink's low latency capabilities make it really well suited for applications that require instantaneous insights, a new action occurs, you immediately have your uh, dashboards update, so real-time dashboards. Um, similarly, fraud detection systems. You know, if you need to have stateful processing, exactly one semantics to monitor things like transactions or detect suspicious behavior in real time, Flink has really good systems built in for that. Um, and then also complex event processing. So Flink supports a lot of advanced event processing scenarios. So analyzing sensor data streams or processing logs for anomalies. Um, it's really w well suited to that where you know, a single data point needs to go through a really complex series of processes. Uh, but that's Apache Flink. Now we'll move on to the next tool, which is Apache Spark. So now on to Apache Spark. So Spark, been around for a while. Um, it's a unified analytics engine that is really designed for, I'd say core at its core batch processing, but some people use it for stream processing for data. Um, and it, like I said, initially was built as a batch processing engine, but it introduced structured streaming, which is a micro batching model for handling streaming workloads. Um, and Spark really offers a pretty rich set of APIs for SQL, machine learning, graph processing, and is one of the most versatile frameworks in the data processing space. And is also relatively easy to use because you can probably bring whatever language you're most comfortable with, whether it's Spark or Python, um, and use that and use Spark to pr actually process your data in the language you are most comfortable with. Um, and so pros of Spark, and you can kind of see the example here, how to get started in all five of these main languages. Um, and it is really, really widely used. Uh, there's very few companies that don't use Spark for data processing if they're doing you know, kind of big data processing. Um, and the, some of the pros and why companies choose that are it's versatile and unified. So it's able to handle batch processing and streaming data, even if it's not the best at streaming. Um, it has a really consistent and well-developed API that makes it easy to you know, extend and, and program that API into more complex data pipelines. Um, and also has a really rich ecosystem. So it supports a really broad range of analytics and machine learning libraries um, that are you know, easy to install out of the box. So it supports a really wide array of, of you know, machine learning, AI, data processing use cases. Um, and again, like I said, has really good developer friendly APIs um, with uh, you know, kind of objects like data frames and data sets that allow you to perform pretty familiar SQL operations but still under the hood use Spark as the processing engine and make it easier for developers to manipulate structured data in the language they're choosing. Um, and then also has really good fault tolerance. So it's lineage based recovery and micro batching model um, where you know, hey, each batch is recorded, provide fault tolerance there. So knowing, hey, you know, but this is statefully tracked as uh, achieved or not. And so if an application fails, it's able to restart directly from that point of failure and then catch up to its you know, other operations it needs to perform. Um, but on the con side of things, um, Spark's micro batching approach there introduces latency um, because you know, it's going back and kind of recording it. And micro batching means that you're waiting for at least one or two data points to arrive before processing it. Um, so it's less suitable for ultra low latency operations because there's just always gonna be some latency with Spark's um, kind of micro batching streaming light workloads. Um, and then it's also very resource intensive. The architecture and flexibility of Spark results in, I mean, it's always gonna have higher CPU and re uh, memory requirements typically than other applications. Um, so it's less efficient for real-time applications compared to frameworks like Flink because it's really overkill to have that much resource, uh, those, those many resources available just for transforming a single value um, if you're doing true streaming workloads. Um, and then deploying Spark, it's pretty easy. Um, you can run it, you know, just with Docker images. They have much of uh, publicly available ones here, and typically involves just running this on a cluster of compute uh, using Kubernetes. 
the Spark driver kind of program, the core of Spark will manage the job and actually you know, kind of tracking its progress. And then it's gonna use that Kubernetes cluster to uh, provision a, a set of worker nodes that are actually gonna run those tasks um, in parallel. And then structured streaming applications, you'll need to be running those obviously continuously, processing micro batches as they arrive. Um, so, you know, and again, that kind of format. And then for fault tolerance, you're gonna to need to set up, uh, Spark relies really heavily on checkpointing and write ahead logs, storing again on a distributed file system. So having one of those kind of linked attached to your Spark environment is crucial. And it also integrates really well with kind of centralized monitoring tools like Prometheus. Um, and there's also the Spark web UI for kind of in tool uh, performance tracking and resource usage. Um, so it's best use cases and the best kind of tools that you're gonna use or you'll have for it are things like batch and hybrid processing. Um, I, I wouldn't say this is the best tool for real-time data processing, but it's really good for batch data processing, historical data processing, um, ETL pipelines, or you know, BI workloads where, hey, maybe I refresh this like once a week. It's also really good for machine learning pipelines um, with MLib. Um, it is able to uh, support really scalable machine learning models and also integrates with like every machine learning model or tool or most machine learning tools out there um, because you have PySpark, so Python based. Um, so it's really good for building real time recommendation systems or things like predictive analytics. Um, and then also really good for just like ad hoc interactive queries where, you know, maybe I just want to, I'm not querying the same thing every day, but I need to constantly be able to access and transform data as needed. Spark SQL capabilities are really good for that. So data exploration and reporting are another real strong suit for it. Um, so that's Spark in a nutshell. Now on to the final one, Apache Storm. So now we have finally the least documented option out of these three, which is Apache Storm. Um, and so Apache Storm is a real-time distributed stream process engine that is designed, unlike Spark, for ultra low latency processing. So it processes data through a topology of various spouts, which are data sources, um, and bolts, which are processing units, which is basically linked together with a many by many basis. Um, and so Spark's architecture is geared towards just simple, low latency, high throughput workloads, um, where it's really just ideal for applications that require sub-second processing. Um, and Spark, Storm has basically what's called a tuple-based model. Um, which provides sub-second latencies because it's able to distribute the processing across many different nodes um, and also have each kind of relationship be, hey, data source is attached to its own individual processing unit. Um, and then it's also pretty scalable because it's scalable by you know, having those tasks distributed across many different worker nodes. So it ensures really high throughput because, hey, you bring on a new data source, you have a new bolt that's going to process it. Um, and it's just pretty simple to set up for basic real-time stream processing tasks. It's not super complex, um, but when I go into the cons, you'll kind of realize that. And so here you can kind of see another view of the architecture. So you have the master node that is controlling all the scheduling jobs. Then the supervisor nodes each consist of a spout and a bolt. So each worker node has the spout that it's pulling data from and also doing the processing within that supervisor node as well. And then there's a zookeeper service, which is keeping track and monitoring and provisioning additional compute as needed and scaling those buckets of supervisors. Um, so not the most complex architecture, but just something to you know, grasp. Uh, it takes a little bit to grasp um, and understand what, if you're first using, your first time trying to use real-time distributed stream processing. Um, so some cons of this approach and, you know, heard of the benefits, scalable, flexible, low latency. But it also by default has at least once processing. So not super sufficient for applications that need strong consistency guarantees. Um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that, hey, each data is going to be processed only once. It could process data twice. Um, it just doesn't, it's not meant to have those really, you know, kind of tight guarantees on consistency of data production. And it's also, very lightweight. So it has limited versatility. Um, it's got less, much less advanced features for handling batch data or integrating you know, machine learning models or really doing anything other than basic op operations. So it's much less suitable for applications beyond just like basic streaming. Um, and the setup of a storm production just involves configuring a cluster of nodes you have with a Nimbus master node and then a series of these supervisor worker nodes and so the Nimbus node manages topology submissions and you know understanding, hey, this data is going from here to there. 
resource allocation for each of the supervisor nodes, and then each of those supervisor nodes actually executes the tasks. Um, and then Storm's fault tolerance is achieved by if there's a failed tuple, so a failed transference from a spout to a bolt, um, it'll retry and replay that failed tuple um, and achieve that at least once guarantee. Um, but if you want to have exactly once guarantees, you'll need to use other configurations like Trident and then bring in other tools. Um, and then for monitoring, typically, you know, you would just either use the built-in UI or output to, you know, a Prometheus Grafana stack. Um, and so some of the best use cases for Apache Storm are, number one, real-time data ingestion. So really effective for simple ingestion tasks. If you're just like collecting sensor data or log events with, and you want to have low latency, Sparks, or Storm's a good option for that. Also stream processing with low complexity. So applications that require quick responses to simple events, you know, like basic loading systems, those are gonna thrive on Storm's low latency processing. Um, and then also high throughput systems. If you need to process large volumes of data really rapidly, like real-time bidding systems or monitoring platforms, Storm's architecture is gonna perform really efficiently in those use cases. Um, so that is all I have for you to do for this day. So I hope this helped uh, the viewer that commented it. Uh, thanks for the video idea. Uh, but really just wanna leave you, leave you with kind of summary. Flink, best suited for stateful, low latency event-driven applications. Spark, best for batch processing and hybrid data processing scenarios. Storm, best for low latency, real-time data ingestion for processing of simple streams. Um, so those are kind of your three guiding lights for those. I hope this video helps you make a decision which tool is the right tool for your use case, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.